now I will see there are quite a few hand raises. 1105, I think this is Nitte Minakshi, Bangalore. Over to you. Sir, in F1.2, F1.2, I could not get where we have to take Q is equal to MCV delta T and MCP delta T. So, you told that it is a sterile work, you should not take MCV delta T. But uh, I am not understanding, sir. Please explain See, clearly, sir. Uh, F1.2, first thing, it is a rigid container. So, rigid container means W expansion is 0. That does not mean W is 0. We know the initial state, final state can be computed. The heat absorbed is given. Assume air to be an ideal gas, etcetera, etcetera. Final temperature, change in internal energy and work done. The first law has to be written as Q equals delta E plus W. Okay. Q is given, so we have no issue with it. It is absorbed 195 kilojoules. So, this is equal to plus 195 kilojoules, substitute in this. Delta E, we assume delta E equals delta U, that has to be an assumption. Then since W expansion is 0, the only other component which seems to be present is the stirrer work, while it is stirred. So, this becomes delta U plus W stirrer since delta expansion is 0. So, here an assumption is W equals W expansion plus W stirrer. W expansion is 0 because it is a rigid container and there is no hint of a third or fourth component of work. Now, we are uh, asked to assume air to be an ideal gas C with C V that given value. Now, since air is an ideal gas, we can write delta U is uh, M into C V into delta T that is T 2 minus T 1 and T 2 can be calculated if you draw the two diagrams. The two diagrams would be a system diagram. Three kg air. There is a stirrer work. Since it is rigid, you can write W expansion is zero. Q is specified, and there is no piston or anything rigid. And on the P V diagram, everything is going to happen at a constant volume. This is the initial state, this is the final state. Uh, what is given is uh, 75 degrees C uh, from 5 bar 75 degrees C to 12 bar. So, this is going to be the 75 degrees C isobar, this will be the isobar for T 2, this pressure and this pressure are given 5 and 12 bar. Since we know the pressure and volume, the pressure and temperature at this point, it is constant volume. So, if we know the pressure at this point, temperature at T 2, temperature T 2 can be determined. The moment you determine T 2, you can determine delta U, because M is given to be 3 kg, value of C V is specified. And then in the first law, the derived form, we remember we always start from this form. The final derived form will be Q equals delta U plus W S T. Delta U has been calculated, Q is given. So, W S T is the only unknown. I hope that satisfies you. Over to you. Sir, what is the order of law, sir? Zeroth law, first law, second law. You told that. Uh First law, zero line, second law. Is See, these are these are the three laws, and we just call them as first law, zero law, second law, purely for historical reasons. I said historically, second law is first because the 
second law is based on the original thoughts of Carnot and Carnot's uh, work even precedes the work of Joule and uh, Benjamin Rumford. So, historically the thinking process pertaining to the second law or which ended up at second law began first. The process thinking process thought processes which led to the formulation of the first law began later a few decades later and the thought processes leading to the zeroth law began still later. Okay. Instead of that we could have called it uh, maybe the second law could have been called Carnot's law the first law could have been called Joule's law, in which case there would not be any question of uh, a first, second and things like that. Okay. This is just the way we arbitrarily assign uh, signs to directions, uh, we have assigned names to these laws or numbers to these laws. Okay. That is it, over. Last question sir, in uh, F1.1, so I am not understanding that the system is brought back to its initial state by non quasi static process. Okay. See in F1.1 we have a uh, process since it, there is a mention of expansion let us assume that it is a cylinder piston type of arrangement and this is our system. So there is definitely an expansion work but there could be some other work also. There could also be some heat transfer, actually there is also heat transfer. Okay. Now this is only a generic thing, we are not going to, this only shows us the scheme. The actual process is on some say on a PV diagram, we are given that it initially executes a constant pressure process from an initial state 1 to a final state 2, okay. expanding from 2 meter cube to 2.25 meter cube against a constant pressure of 1.5 bar. It is a constant pressure, so at least on the PV diagram it seems to be something like this a quasi static process it is given it is a quasi static process. So, this is the process 1 let me call it 1 A 2. The system is brought back to its initial state, the initial state was 1, this was the final state for the first process. It is brought back by some non quasi static process, just link this up by some dotted line. This is process B, just to remove clutter and for clarity I have shown it above A. You could have shown it below A, nothing wrong. You can even shown it uh, crossing A any number of times, but dotted line. So, the position of the line is meaningless. So, 1 A 2 is the first process. The second process is 2 B 1. Is that clear now? Over. We understood the concept sir, formula we are unable to get it sir, but the answer we are getting. The, there is no formula, you apply first law for the first process, you apply first law for the second process. For example, if you take the first process, in the first process what is given? It absorbs 80 kilo joules of heat. So, the specification is Q 1 A 2 is plus 80 kilo joules. Okay. It expands from 2 meter cube to 2.25 meter cube against a constant pressure of 1.5 bar. So, W is W expansion plus W other and W other is 0, but this you need to assume and W expansion is integral P d V, you can integrate it because it is quasi static and because it is constant pressure this becomes P into V 2 minus V 1, P is specified, V 2 is specified, V 1 is specified. So, we know W, this is W 1 A 2, right. 
So, now apply q equals q 1 a 2 is delta e 1 to 2 plus w 1 a 2. This is calculated, this is calculated, so this is now known. Okay. Now, come to the second part of the process. In the second part of the process, what is given? System is brought back to its initial state. So, that means delta E 2 1 will be equal to delta E 1 2. Why? Is the same in the other direction. 1 is E 2 minus E 1, this is E 2 minus E 1, whereas this will be E 1 minus E 2. Final is 1, initial is 2. Okay. And then apply, uh, we are given the heat, it rejects 100 kilojoules of heat. What is the work done? You have to apply first law, Q, because first law is the only law which relates Q to the rest of the world. So, Q, I will write it completely. Second process Q 2 A 1 equals delta E 2 1 plus W 2 1. Delta E 2 1 is minus delta E 1 2 which has been calculated. So, this is known. Q 2 A 1 is given minus 100 kilojoules. The only unknown is W 2 1. There is another way to solve this problem. Before somebody asks a question, let me uh, notice that 1A2 followed by 2B1 is a cycle. Okay. Now, for a cycle, delta E is 0, because it comes back to its original state, initial and final state are the same. Okay. So, Q cycle will be delta E cycle plus W cycle, delta E cycle is 0. Q cycle can be written down as Q 1 A 2 plus Q 2 B 1, both are given. W cycle is written down as W 1 A 2 plus W 2 B 1. This is to be determined. What about W 1 A 2? W 1 A 2 is W expansion 1 A 2, assume W other 1 A 2 is 0. This assumption is something which we have made already, W other is 0. So, the same assumption needs to be made here. And because it is a constant pressure process, this is to be evaluated exactly as it was evaluated here. So, once you evaluate that, you will notice that in this expression only 2 B 1 is the unknown, which you extract. In this case, we do not have to go through the intermediate stage of determining delta E 1 2 and delta E 2 1. That is not asked, so you can use the alternate method also, but if delta E were to be asked, you would have to use the first method. Over. Sir, in which case work done will be more, in which case work done will be more sir? Quasi static or non quasi static process? There is nothing, there is no such idea that in one particular case work done is more. Work done and heat transfer and the change of state have to be such that the first law of thermodynamics has to be satisfied. Q equals delta E plus W has to be satisfied, whether it is quasi static or not. Okay. So, do not be under an impression that work done in a non quasi static process is higher or lower or anything like that. There is no relation between the amount of work done and whether the process is quasi static or non quasi static. If it is quasi static, then you can evaluate the work done, because area under that curve in the appropriate process diagram may be the work done. Over and out. Hello, 1228 Loyola. So, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Myself, Queen Florence Mary. 
assistant professor in mechanical engineering department i have solved question number 4 f 1.4 but i want to know whether the steps i have followed is correct or not sir uh, it is given it's perfectly insulated so uh, it's an adiabatic process so q equal to 0 right uh, first we have, and uh, two work is there one is expansion work and another one is stirrer work so first yes. i have found out the expansion work using pdv equation and uh, to find the volume i have used t1 divided by v1 equal to t2 divided by v2 because pressure remains constant right you are right so i got the answer v2 0.11 meter cube okay. and then uh, uh, to find cv i used 1 by gamma minus 1 into r gamma value 1.4 is given to find r i used the formula a uh, universal gas constant divided by molecular weight right so i got the answer for cv and then del u uh, it is cv into del t using that i have found out del u right and then q we know it from first law of thermodynamics it is del e plus uh, w net right that is expansion plus stirrer work right. using that first i found out the w net mm -hmm. and then w net is equal to expansion plus stirrer work using wait, that wait, i have found out how, how did you get work. the stirrer work you can't find out net work you write you wrote q equals delta e plus w that's right okay q is zero what did you q do q is zero what del u i got from c no you have to assume that delta e uh, actually is delta del u yes sir i assume that delta e equal to delta, delta u and then you and can i have substituted delta the u. value then uh, delta u i have calculated as cv yes that you calculated uh, substituted the value right yes sir and uh, from that i have found out work from first law and from the uh, from actually that work is expansion work plus stirrer work na uh, let me say that look f 1.4 in f 1.4 you wrote q equals delta e plus w under the assumption that delta e is delta u you expanded w this became delta u plus w expansion plus w stirrer w expansion you calculated delta u you calculated q is given to be zero i think it's adiabatic and hence w stirrer is extracted is that the method you followed i think if network is also asked that means first you calculate this and then ex extract the subtract the w expansion you will get w net w stirrer i think that's okay i did actually instead of expansion and stirrer work i have put network yes and then i have expanded network is equal to expansion work plus stirrer work and from that i have found out the yes. stirrer work that's perfectly all right over and out 1175 truba college gopal sir i want to ask question number f 1.7 consider the action of an air gun right the gun consists of a chamber of volume vc Connect connected to a long cylindrical barrel of volume bb right sir i don't understand this question okay i think the question is simply this if you start sketching the diagram that should become easier you have a chamber of volume this is v c v chamber we have a long barrel of this gun and the volume from this point up to this point is v b that is the import of the first two sentences initially compressed air at pressure pc and temperature tc is filled in the chamber so here the initial state is air at pc tc the bullet is located at the chamber end of the barrel so let's say this is the bullet
and is held in place by a stopper. There is some mechanism which keeps it there. Then we press the trigger, the bullet is released that the stopper does not stop the bullet. So, now out here there will be some ambient pressure and P naught ambient pressure if you read the. So, initially the ambient pressure acts on the other side of the bullet. So, since there is a lower ambient pressure on one side and higher chamber pressure on the other side, the bullet will start accelerating, moving and the air will expand because as the bullet moves more and more volume will be available for the uh, gas or the air in the chamber. When the bullet is released, the air in the chamber expands into the barrel and accelerates the bullet. Now, assume the bullet behaves like a leak proof frictionless piston, air expands adiabatically and air behaves like an ideal gas with constant specific heats. Now, this is the system diagram. Let me start by saying that to begin with my system is the air in the chamber and the volume of the system expands as the bullet moves. So, for example, if the bullet is here, the my system will expand right up to the inner surface of the bullet. Finally, when the bullet leaves, this will become an open system, but it would expand, but we will consider the process up to that. If I consider for my system, which is shown by the dotted line here and show it on a PV diagram. My initial volume will be simply V c. Final volume, the final state when the bullet just leaves, I will consider up to that point because once that is done, the total whatever remaining pressure will be just dissipated and the bullet will not get affected by this because it is not confined within the barrel. So, the final volume will be V c plus V b. The initial pressure is P c. So, this is the initial state 1 of our system. We are asked to determine something. We are asked that the bullet behaves like a leak proof frictionless piston. Okay air expands adiabatically. Let us also assume that the expansion process can be modelled as a quasi static process. In that case, this will turn out to be some expansion like this. So, this is the state 2. Of course, depending on where V b is compared to V c, your atmospheric pressure P naught could be here or could be even higher than 2. There is a hint as whether there is an optimal length of the uh, barrel. Okay. It has something to do with where the atmospheric pressure lies. Now, what will happen is the air expands as it expands adiabatically, quasi statically and if you assume that there is no other work, there is no mention of a stirrer or electrical work, then this expansion under these assumptions will turn out to be P v raise to gamma is constant. So, given V b, V c, you can write down the expansion for the work done by the system on the bullet. Okay. That is one part of the process. Now, what happens to the work done by the system on the bullet? Consider bullet as your system now. When you consider bullet as your system, let us see what happens to it as it moves through the barrel. As it moves to the barrel, on one side there is the pressure P of the gas. On the other side, there is a pressure P naught of the atmosphere. So, the net force on the uh, bullet is P into the area of the piston, uh, area of the bullet on the gas side, P into area of the uh, bullet 
on the air side. This expands, so there is some amount of work done. This amount of work interaction is W gas. There is another amount of work interaction from this side, I do not think I am showing the thing, which is W naught work done against the atmosphere. Now, if this is your system, for this system write Q equals delta E plus W. Okay. Now, it is not given here, but there is, um, I think it is given here that frictionless bullet, frictionless piston. So, there is no work done against uh, piston. So, you will have to assume the following. We will have to assume that delta E for the bullet is delta U plus delta E kinetic and we will say since there is no uh, friction and the bullet is small, we will assume that there is no change in the temperature of the bullet and we will assume that delta U of the bullet is 0 leading to delta E of the bullet being delta E kinetic. We will also assume that the interaction between the gas and the bullet is only a work type of interaction. So, we will assume that the bullet is essentially adiabatic. So, that gives you delta E kinetic of the bullet plus W is 0 and W will be work done by the bullet. So, this will be work done by the bullet on the ambient plus work done by the bullet on the gas and this particular term is the negative of the term sorry this will be minus work done by gas on the bullet which is something which we have calculated in this scheme and that essentially is the area under this curve. And with a small assumption that the volume of the bullet is negligible compared to the volume of the barrel, the work done by the atmosphere on the bullet, sorry bullet on the atmosphere would be this. And this is also obtained as volume of the barrel multiplied by the atmospheric pressure. This is obtained, so we have obtained W, which would be a reasonably negative number. Substitute that here, so you will get delta E kinetic, and delta E kinetic will be half mass of the bullet into V muzzle, that is when it leaves the barrel minus half mass of the bullet V initial, I think V muzzle is called V naught there, V initial squared. Since initially the bullet is held in place, this V initial is 0. So, once you calculate delta E, which is delta E kinetic, you can calculate V naught, the muzzle velocity of the bullet. This is a idealized, but one of the standard uh, first problems which you solve when you solve internal ballistics. External ballistics is what we do in school, determining the projectiles and ranges etcetera. Internal ballistics is what happens inside a gun or a cannon or a pistol and this is one of the simplest first steps in internal ballistics. Over and out, 1241 NRI, I hope we are able to talk today, over to you. Good afternoon sir, this is Sunil Khabia from NRI group of institutions Bhopal. Sir, when I teach first law of thermodynamics, um, I use the equation delta Q is equal to delta W plus DE because heat interaction <coughs> and work interaction are path function, they are inexact differentials. Whereas, when I saw your lecture today morning, uh, you have used dq is equal to dw plus de. So, would you please throw some light on it, sir? You are bringing me to a, 
rather sensitive part and my students will see first law can be applied to a process element it can also be applied to a full process by process element by full process we mean something like this from state 1 to state 2 by some way or the other by process element we mean we take two neighboring states changing by some small delta v and some small delta p or whatever it is okay this is the process element part whereas this is the process part when it comes to process element we write the small amount of heat which is absorbed by the system turns out to be the small amount of work which is done by the system plus the small increase in its energy. Since we know that work is a path function and heat also is a path function, we quite often write d prime w or d cross w etcetera that is a question of nomenclature if you do not want to write it it is perfectly ok. But you should remember that this is an exact differential and these two are inexact differentials. By integrating this you can come to the process equation when you integrate d e over a process you will get delta e. When you integrate dW over a process, because it is an inexact differential, the integral of dW will depend on the path and you will only get an interaction which we call W, we never call it delta W or W2 minus W1. Similarly, on the left hand side dQ is an elementary interaction, you can integrate it out appropriately over the path. But when you integrate it over a process, all that you will get is the total amount of heat transfer Q, not delta Q or Q2 minus Q1. So, this is only the differential form of our first law, this is the corresponding integral form for the first law. I am very particular when I tell my students that never make the mistake of writing delta q or delta w that is something which bugs me a lot and my students suffer very significantly if any one of them dares write delta q or delta w over to you uh, one more question sir uh, sir today morning you explained very beautifully that heat is a path function uh, but we use the uh, concept of uh, concept that work done by a diabetic system from state 1 to is, state 2 is independent of path. Now, what I want is uh, if I uh, try to explain by a PV graph, it is very easy for me to explain that work is a path function, but is there any graphical way of explaining to students that heat is a path function? Uh, I cannot use the concept of entropy and TTS diagram here because when I, when I am teaching first law of thermodynamics, the student do not have the background of entropy, sir. Over. See, I understand the difficulty that uh, with graphical methods using, for example, the PV diagram, you can show that work is obviously a path function. Uh, Graphically, it is difficult for us to show that heat is a path function only when we use the uh, first law of thermodynamics. In uh, after studying the second law of thermodynamics, we will have a relation between the heat interaction and the area uh, in the TS diagram. We will use that appropriately. But all that we can say is out here, since delta E is a state function. But W is a path function, since right hand side has at least one path function involved, the left hand side is also a path function. That perhaps is the only thing we can, we can explain to the students just now. In fact, in thermodynamics, we always get into this situation. 
thermodynamics as a whole is a is a is a complete science actually if possible one should simultaneously be appreciating zeroth law first law and second law and that is what has been done by a few uh, developers of uh, formulations of thermodynamics particularly uh, hatsopoulos and keenan and to some extent by giles absolutely purely topological formulation but those formulations are very difficult for us to absorb and very very difficult for us to teach to students in the first and second year of engineering that is why we have to follow the more or less traditional path of one law after another so what happens is there are some links which we have to keep floating as forward links and uh, then come back to it and say that look this is what we for example even uh, uh, boyle's law and joule's law later on we will show that uh, if the ideal gas equation is of this type then from that it necessarily follows that uh, if uh, the equation of state is of pv equals rt type then uh, your u will be a function only of uh, temperature but uh, let initially we have to keep those two things as separate over to you one more question sir uh, in thermo uh, how to develop the interest of the students uh, in thermodynamics because in thermodynamics we always present thing in a mathematical form energy we change in energy we define as delta q by delta delta w then enthalpy also we define in a mathematical form u plus e then entropy also we define in a mathematical form integral d q by t the student asks well, i want to see entropy what as a teacher i am basically a teacher of engineering drawing for first time i am uh, teaching thermodynamics and it is very mathematical sir how to bring physics in it well, the student asked me sir i want to see entropy i i am helpless sir you are helpless everybody is helpless uh, in fact mathematics is the tool which we use physics is the basic scheme on which we work so uh, deriving something as an exact differential and then integrating is is mathematics but uh, joule's experiment and hence the generalization that w adiabatic between two states is independent of the path is physics similarly later on when we go to the second law till we come to the definition of entropy we will be using mathematics throughout but those uh, efficiencies of engines their comparisons possibilities and impossibilities of heat transfer that is all physics but the actually the difficulty everywhere is uh, in particularly in thermodynamics is you can't feel velocity you can't feel temperature we feel as hot and cold but internal energy entropy enthalpy it's something which uh, we can't feel but we can apply things and see the result in fact the problem 1.7 the bullet problem came out uh, came a few years ago because a student with a background in the navy asked me uh, sir why is it that always we sketch our thing at cylinder piston and he made a funny statement saying hardly anything in life or in engineering in cylinder and piston and i took objection to that and saying that look uh, you drove your car or your scooter from your home to this place he stays in the naval quarters a few kilometers from it he stayed at that time and he said the car engine is nothing but a set of cylinders and pistons with other mechanisms and i said you use a gun you use a cannon you use a torpedo the basic mechanism everywhere there is a cylinder and piston even in a household situation or a medicine situation you go to a, a doctor he injects something into your vein or in your muscle that injection is a cylinder and piston at home or uh, near your office you pump uh, air in your car uh, tire or uh, scooter tire that is a cylinder and piston earlier we used to have kerosene stoves and we used to have a crude uh, reciprocating pump for pulling out kerosene that is a cylinder and piston so uh, one should give them illustrations of situations which are as near our situations are possible but that is possible only when you start solving problems and by including such problems like guns and 
particularly when it comes to open systems we will have large number of uh, real life problems but when it comes to basic development we have to consider ideal and semi ideal situations and uh, it's difficult uh, for a few students and perhaps even a few faculty members to link uh, physics with reality but i appreciate your concern over to you thank you sir one more uh, suggestion i want from you uh, what type of industrial tours matlab uh, to which industries we should uh, organize tour so that at least a student feel that thermodynamics re is really very much needed uh, at present to develop the in interest on uh, at present to develop the interest of students in thermodynamics we say them that it is important important from competitions point of view like gate and uh, indian engineering services but uh, uh, what i feel is that if uh, uh, some type of industrial tours can be conducted at the start starting of thermodynamics course so uh, which industry we should visit okay you don't really have to go to industry uh, a few years ago i uh, took a tour of a few students uh, just around the campus if you take them to your hydraulics lab particularly as you teach them open thermodynamic systems where you talks of pumps turbines blowers compressors in your hydraulics lab you have enough of these illustrations the second stop should be the uh, a central uh, air conditioning plant now in central air conditioning plant you have compressors you have pumps you have fans you have heat exchangers and mark and show each one of them and on a pad or on a notebook show each one of them and sketch out the corresponding uh, open system show the inlet outlet the flows and the uh, streams as they go in Uh, generally when we teach thermodynamics the students have to some extent learn part of fluid mechanics sometimes so uh, fluid mechanics they are able to appreciate but don't go into the details of heat exchanger because heat transfer is a subject which i think almost invariably follows thermodynamics in our scheme of teaching but uh, if you have a reasonably laid out uh, and equipped campus i think in the campus itself you have uh, a good number of illustrations which you can show to students of thermodynamics but remember just don't take them there before going to taking them to that place go there yourself find out what the um, systems are sketch out some things inlet outlet flows etc and then take the students there we have to do some homework before we take the student and over and out let me go to some other center now 1210 gokte institute udyam bag karnataka over to you uh, good afternoon professor so uh, this is guru raj i am asking a question about the first law sir uh, during the first session throughout the uh, throughout the session i have not heard anything called as a conservation of the energy is the first law doesn't uh, other the name of the first law is the conservation of energy even not a single word i heard about it <laughs> see uh, i agree with you and uh, but you should also agree with me that uh, we have developed first law and we have solved number of problems without talking of conservation of energy okay uh, now conservation is a very very common word and conservation of energy means conservation of x means uh, generally means like for example conservation of mass the traditional newtonian thing says can conservation of mass means mass cannot be created mass cannot be destroyed and if uh, a system changes its mass or if we find that a system has changed its mass uh, if it has increased that means mass from outside the system must have come in and if it has decreased that means mass from within the system must have been extracted or must have flowed out or moved out of the system okay uh, our first law we can say is a um, uh, conservation of energy but if you really want to look, look at it is remember that we have q equals delta e plus w conservation of energy would essentially mean delta e equals 0 
just the way for a closed system conservation of mass would mean delta m equals 0. But now if you want to have delta e equals 0 that means what you would have to say is if system is isolated then this implies no interaction w is 0, q is 0 and that implies delta E equals 0 and then that in traditional uh, physics would mean conservation of uh, energy is implied, but it essentially is for isolated systems. In fact, the conservation of energy uh, even in physics is a idea which is somehow enforced because if you uh, consider mechanics or if you consider uh, the field theory in physics, they always have so called a conservative force field and a non-conservative force field. There are conservative forces like gravitation, there are non-conservative forces like friction. Okay. They say conservative forces like gravitation because if you go along a loop, Fds in a gravitational force field would be 0. But if friction is present, F uh, into the appropriate displacement across friction will not be 0. We consider that friction now to be an interaction. So, all that we say is turning this equation around, we can say is delta E is Q minus W. This is another form in which first law will often be written, nothing wrong in it, it is just a transposition of terms. And that means is if there is a change in energy that is because of uh, input of energy in the form of either heat or extraction of energy in the form of W. You can argue that it rep represents conservation of energy, but uh, you need not even talk about conservation of energy. But it was a good question because I generally do not use the word conservation of energy or conservation of uh, entropy or conservation of mass, but it is common and we will use it. Uh, when it comes to open thermodynamic systems. But uh, when I taught uh, or when I discuss first law, I think perhaps by design or on purpose I do not use the word conservation of energy because there is no need to. Over to you. Uh, sir, another question. So, I hope uh, by the last session the first law is over, sir. Uh, I did not get to. I have not seen anything called as a PMM1 so far. See, uh, various because those are the things which needs the for the second law, sir. Even in second law, we do not have a PMM and I will not be talking of any PMM1 or PMM2. These are all interpretations of uh, terms used by other people. For example… Uh, no, sir. My question is general. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. General in any of the syllabus of the any of the university in India, the PMM1 and PMM2 are the in, uh, integrated part of the syllabus. That is, that is, I, 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 I am a bit upset here. It is integrated part because it has been decided to keep it there for the last hundred years. It is not an integrated part of an IIT Bombay or any other IIT thermodynamics thing. Okay. Just because it was there in 1857 does not mean it has to be there in 1957 and it does not mean it has to be in 2012. If you just want to do copy and paste, as somebody did yesterday in the Moodle discussion, he went to Wikipedia and just cut some five lines and put it in the Moodle. And I shouted at him saying this is plagiarism. So, essentially uh, talking about PMM1 and PMM2 is not plagiarism, but that is, I would say that is resistance to change. And uh, what I propose is if you have understood your first law properly, then um, uh, archaic concepts like PMM1 and PMM2, you should be able to take in your stride. And if you believe that, look, those are archaic concepts and we need not talk about it anymore, you know, influence your nearest members of your committees or board of studies to say, rewrite your thermodynamics. Why are you using 100 year old terms? Why are we not using or why are we not discussing caloric theory in thermodynamics anymore? Because it is considered no need to talk about it. So, I think I should go to some other center over and out. 1144 KCB Technical Academic Indoor, over to you. So, my question is uh, that uh, as we know that Cp upon Cv is equals to gamma and uh, 
why is it a function of temperature okay uh, gamma is defined as the question is by cp by cv is gamma now again there are many parameters and combinations in thermodynamics which come up again and again thermodynamics and related downstream fields for example in compressible flow perhaps the most common symbol you will be using perhaps is gamma okay apart from the normal english letters so the ratio of cp to cv turns up so often in thermodynamics and many other related branches of physics and engineering that it's useful for us to shorten it to a symbol like gamma just the way the partial derivative du by dt at constant volume comes up so often that we have used started using cv as a short form for that or even h means u plus pv why it comes so often we will see when we come to open thermodynamic systems now for cp and cv will be functions of temperature and maybe some other parameter for a general gas but so this will be in general cp of say temperature and volume cv of temperature and volume and this implies gamma is a function of temperature and volume okay this is general for an ideal gas again gamma is cp by cv but cp is a function only of temperature cv is a function only of temperature this implies gamma is a function of temperature okay for an ideal gas with constant specific heats well gamma will simply be which is defined as cp by cv but since all the specific heats are constant this will turn out to be that's it remember that many of our expressions for example in ideal uh, for an uh, adiabatic process quasi static only pdv work to be done for an ideal gas only when it is constant specific heats that we can write it as pv rest to gamma is constant if the specific heats are not constant we can't integrate it out straight away assuming gamma to be a constant and get an expression in this closed form over to you sir is it possible uh, that uh, cp and cv both are the function of temperature but gamma is not a function of temperature uh, is it any there any case in which it is possible see that will be mm, i i don't know whether it will be possible because you know uh, if you even if you consider a gamma um, uh, even if you consider an ideal gas but non constant specific heats uh, cp it cv plus r so if you uh, uh, expand it like that this becomes uh, gamma becomes 1 plus cv by r so the moment cv is a function of temperature gamma will be a function of temperature and when uh, Uh, cp and cv become functions of temperature and temperature and something else then gamma does not remain constant and if gamma is not constant uh, well its importance sort of reduces because we can't we are unable to get closed form expressions in terms of gamma so if we feel gamma is important because we quite often even in gas dynamics assume that cp and cv are reasonable constants or can be replaced by their average values over a range and then treat their ratio as gamma a constant value and go ahead with it the advantage of using it is under certain simplifying assumptions you can get closed form expressions that's the only advantage of gamma otherwise there is nothing special about gamma over to you in some books it is explained that uh, 
P and C are linear, linearly dependent on temperature. Is there only linear dependency on temperature? Nothing. See, the thermodynamics does not say how a property should behave. Later on, when we say two days later, when we derive property relations, it will be clear that thermodynamics will never dictate the value of a property. At most, it will say that if property x varies like this, property y with respect to something else has to vary like that. It uh, restricts the variation of property with respect to each other. But uh, it will, thermodynamics will never say that Cp will have to be a linear function of temperature or anything like that. Uh, it so happens that for most of our gases and fluids of uh, common occurrence, over a reasonable range over temperatures which we come across, that means a few bars of pressure or maybe a few tens of bars, temperatures going from maybe minus 50 to plus 200, most of these variations are slow enough for us to be able to modulate them as linear. But there are situations, for example, if you go to high pressure water, supercritical water, the Cp and Cv values, they vary in a maddening fashion. Again, assumptions are linearity or approximations which we invoke to be able to do our mathematics and calculus in a similar way. Otherwise, there is nothing special about linearity. Over to you. Sir, gamma is Cp upon Cv. Mathematically, we can also write gamma equal to d, del H upon del U. What does it mean, sir? Over to you. No, what does gamma have to do with partial of H with respect to U? The definition of gamma is Cp divided by Cv. If you want, you can expand it. Cp is partial of H with respect to temperature at constant pressure and uh, Cv is partial of U with respect to uh, temperature at constant volume, but the two derivatives are under two different circumstances. If you want to derive it further, you will have to go through the complicated uh, property relations. Do not ever uh, think that gamma is uh, ratio of delta H to delta U or anything like that. Thank you.